My name is Gene Dubail. I'm the editor of the uh, Milford Spectrum and the managing editor of the News Times. And we are co-sponsoring this debate with the Milford Public Library. Uh, just want to talk a little bit, say a couple thanks to a couple of people, and um, uh, explain what the ground rules are. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, everybody for turning out. It's a very good turnout. And, uh, I hope we don't all uh, get overcome by the heat by the end of the evening. Warm. I want to thank the candidates, um, uh, Mayor Pat Murphy and Challenger Dave Grombach for appearing tonight. Um, and I want to say uh, a thank you to the moderator, who I'll introduce shortly, Matthew Rienzo, and um, recognize a couple of people. It's Sally Tornow from the library. She's right here. Right there. Right there. Right there. My name is Jim um, So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to run about 90 minutes. We will start with a two-minute statement by each candidate. And then after that, we'll ask a series of questions that Matt will pose. Um, we'll have the first person who's asked a question will have two minutes to respond. The challenger, will, or the, the respondent will have another two minutes to answer. And the first candidate will have 30 seconds for a rebuttal if they want. The, um, the I will act as timekeeper. I give people a 30 second warning on their two minutes and a 10 second warning on the 30 second rebuttals. Afterward, uh, we will have two minute uh, final statements to give people a chance to sum up. Um, and the ground rules uh, are designed to Impose some order on the discussion and to keep it moving along, but Matt, as the moderator, is fully empowered to uh, impose, to add a little flexibility to it if he thinks a point needs to be elucidated some, if he thinks uh, a candidate is being evasive, uh, he has the ability to probe a little further to ask a follow up question. So the rules are, are, are there to impose some order, as I said, but they're not. that uh, the audience refrain from any clapping or making any noise uh, in support of or against um, anything that's said by one of the candidates. Uh, I think it's just keep things moving more quickly and show maximum respect for the candidates and for uh, each other in the audience. Um, okay, so let me take, uh, briefly introduce Matt uh, DiRienzo. Matt's a native of, uh, uh, I'm not sure where he's a native of, <laughs> He's a longtime uh, Connecticut journalist. Um, at one time, he was the publisher of the Litchfield um, County uh, Times. I'm sorry, Litchfield Times. And after that, for a long time, was the editor of the uh, New Haven Register. Um, he is now teaching journalism at Quinnipiac University <coughs> and the University of New Haven. So I'm going to turn this over to Matt. Um, Start. Great. Great, thank you. So, um, I don't know if you guys read uh, last week uh, or earlier this week, the Connecticut uh, Conference of Municipalities held their annual convention, and there was a speaker who has written a book called If Mayors Ruled the World. And I, I love the, the title of that book and the message, which was the reason that this room is packed is because decisions made here at this level have a much bigger impact on the communities and people's lives than even something that the governor does or um, and therefore, the, the, the power of an individual vote in community is magnified by things or like this. So, without uh, further ado, um, let's start with. Uh, Excuse me, yeah. Blake? Are we having a pledge? We can, sure. for 
While my administration does have a good record relative to completed projects, programs, grants, and financial stability for the town of New Melford, we continue to strive to be better and look to the future. Currently, some of the projects we're working on with bipartisan support are the actual taking down of the Century Brass Building on Scoville Street to make way for appropriate businesses and perhaps tucking a DPW facility in the back corner. We're now starting a phase two environmental study on our current DPW parcel on Youngsfield Road, which is a step that will be required for any riverfront development in the future. The Youngsfield Riverwalk and Greenway project design is complete, and as soon as the final permits are in place from deep, we'll begin construction. A traffic study was completed once the new intersection of Route 67 and Grove Street was opened to review traffic patterns and driver trends. Based on some of those findings, we are in the design phases of a variety of potential improvements to help ease congestion in the town. Now that the town has received the John Pettibone School property, we'll be creating a committee of 15 electors of the town to receive public input and review the variety of proposed uses, costs, and benefits. We've appointed a library modernization committee to help our library better support our community with appropriate space and technology upgrades. Another improvement in our downtown is the expansion for the Senior Center, which we received a $498,000 speed grant for. We have been working through our Substance Abuse Council, HV CASA, outreach programs, and our police to try to assist with the ever-growing drug problem New Milford and all communities are facing. We also just finished the expansion of the parking lot at the Baldwin Park, so we may utilize more of those playing fields. The artificial turf field committee is on schedule with a plan for two multi-sport fields and a new track at the high school. And also our Lynn Denning Park is getting an expanded parking lot, safer traffic flow, and a much needed facelift. So I'll save some of my comments on things I want to see in the future. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So since I announced I was running for mayor back in March, I've been asked a lot of questions a lot of good questions. But the simplest question that I've been asked was also the most important. And that question was, why are you running? Um, it's a question for every candidate, first time or incumbent, local office or president. Why are you running? I'm running because I talk a lot about public service in my line of work. And this is public service that I'm able to do and I'm able to do well. The closing of Pettibone pulled the curtain aside and revealed the way this town was being run. And I didn't like it. I did not like how it appeared a decision was made before people even had a chance to comment. I did not like the refusal to consider alternatives, to heed professional and parental concerns, for caution, and to slow the pace, like other towns had done. Dictation <coughs> rather than collaboration ruled the day. The more I got involved after Pettibone, the more I saw that this town, my town, was being run in a narrow and a closed-minded fashion. Good ideas were stifled, dissenting opinions were suppressed, and it created a self-perpetrating machine that forgot why it was even there, to serve the people. I'm not running because I want a pension or I see this as a career. I have a career as an attorney. I would even support term limits because the danger of entrenched individuals is like a poison in our political system. I'm not running to satisfy my ego or wield power. My style as an attorney is in, li is in line, as in life, is as a collaborator, as somebody who enjoys working with people even though we have opposing interests. I'm not running to dictate my views to the town. I'm running to offer the best minds we have in this town the opportunity to make the prosperity and quality of life that we deserve a reality.
think that it's smarter to take the money that they were putting into maintaining a old facility and putting it into the programs and staff um, was prudent. But I think it should have been more open to the public during the process with the Space Needs Committee that made the recommendation, inviting the press and the public in, and then during all the board meetings, making sure that the information was being pushed out uh, appropriately to the public. Mr. Grubbuck, you have two minutes to respond. Thank you. Uh, regarding the fair comments about Patty Bowen, obviously part of my issue was that I did not believe the process was fair. And I did go to those meetings, the Board of Ed meetings, and I take issue with what the mayor had to say because she was at those meetings and she was nodding her head and, and she was providing guidance to the Board of Ed members at those meetings, sitting front and center. So to say that it's not the way that she would have done it, I don't think conveys the reality of the level of involvement that the mayor had at those meetings. And if there was a concern about the way the process was being conducted, um, she certainly was in a position to call foul or to say, hey, we need to stop this and we need to go in a different direction. But that didn't happen. We had a large number of members of the community come out, speak against uh, the closing of Pettibone. And the perception, whether it's the reality or not, but the perception, and that's what we deal with in government, is that we were ignored, that those people's concerns were not taken into consideration. And a year later, we had to add a kindergarten class because projections were higher than, than estimated. And a lot of what was driving the decision to close Pettibone was this negative idea that our population is declining and it's never gonna recover. But guess what? It's gonna recover, people will move back into New Milford, and when they do, they're gonna need another school. Mayor, you have 30 seconds to respond if you want to. Well, the rest of our school facilities have an uh, excess of acreage, and so if I just take Northville and Hill and Plain, Northville's 36 acres and Hill and Plain is 37. So if after the next 10 years where the declines have been over 25% for us and all the communities around us, including Newtown, um, it would be very inexpensive to add a couple of classrooms onto either of those schools and also not have to provide another set of overhead such as administrators or gymnasiums or uh, cafeterias or another library. And uh, the projection for the next 10 years for our region is um, between 20 and 46% reduction and for us and all the towns around us except for Danbury, and those are state numbers. Um, next question is to Mr. Grimbuck. So um, you are um, running for mayor and not held elective office previously. Why not uh, do like an apprenticeship at like a, a lower board or something like that and going up through a traditional uh, kind of path that some others have? I figured if it was good enough for Trump and probably Fiorona. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could swing there. You know, <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> no, to answer your question seriously, um, I got involved, you're right, relatively um, recently in terms of um, my involvement with the political process of the town. The fact is, I actually reached out a number of years ago to the then DTC um, to get involved and I never heard anything back. I actually called the mayor's office a number of years ago and sent an email because there were so many vacancies on boards and commissions. And I never heard anything back. And the fact is, you know, my life is busy. I've got three kids, I'm an attorney, my wife was commuting, so I kind of let it lie. And it was only within the past uh, um, year, year and a half, when we had a change of leadership in the DTC that I became more involved after the petty bone issue kind of brought me in. And politics is like quicksands. You know, once you step one foot in, it kind of drags you in even further. So I was appointed to the, uh, uh, the policy platform and I chaired that. And from there, um, we reached a point where all my complaining got to either going to put up or shut up. And you know, I did a lot of complaining, and I complained about what the issues were and should be. And they asked me, you know, do you want to run for mayor? So <laughs> rather than say, no, I'd rather do an internship, or I'd rather kind of you know, work my way up the ladder, I saw it as an opportunity to kind of put my money where my mouth is. And um, that's where I am today. Do you want to respond to the question of experience versus uh well, I can appreciate both, both avenues of that, but I will tell you that if you are enrolled in any party, Democrat or Republican, and you email my office to be on a board or commission, we send it to your party chairman at the time. 
to be interviewed and recommended by you because that was the custom at the time. So if that came to my office, I know that my office forwarded it to the then party chair. So, uh, no, I applaud everybody, all in. Any other? No. Okay. Um, so there, uh, getting back a little bit to the, the Pentagon issue, so, somewhat related. So a lot of community, uh, New York, like a lot of communities, is seeing a decline in student population, and that's an issue that's obviously affecting some of these decisions. Um, are there strategies to reverse that, or is reversing it even a goal in terms of population growth? And well, we are all struggling in Connecticut to hang on to our school age population because we all want to see our children and our grandchildren come back here. So part of that has been through economic development or through different housing trends or to try to make your community as uh, aesthetically pleasing or quality of life issues. And so we try to sustain, maintain, and improve what we have to stay as attractive as possible and as affordable as possible. Uh, given the state of Connecticut's uh, position in the economy. So uh, I would say yes, we look forward to the future and we try to improve everything. I mean, we, you can't shake a stick at some of the programs we have with regard to children in our youth. Mr. Grombeck, do you want to respond to two Yeah, that, that's an issue that's near and dear to my heart. I still remember when I moved to New Milford about uh, seven or eight years ago, it was, it's, it's such a traumatic process, but it's still fresh in my mind. The reason, and I'll tell you right now, how you reverse the population decline, you've got to invest in the schools. And right now, our schools are perceived to be subpar. And the number one thing that people are looking at, if you're, a, if you're an empty nester and you're looking to sell your house and you're wondering why it's standing, sitting on the market for a year, it's because the people that you're trying to draw into the town who are going to take out a 30-year mortgage are young families. And young families are not going to move to a town where they perceive that the public education system is in turmoil. And that's what we have here. So I know exactly how we're going to reverse the population issue in New Milford. That's to draw young families into town, make it a place where they feel comfortable to send their, their, their children, as opposed to getting less house in some of the surrounding towns, but feeling better about the public education system there. Well, I think the Board of Ed does a good job with uh, the program money that they receive uh, relative to their overhead. And I think that that's probably part of the decision with putting more money into programs and staff rather than failing facilities. So um, I don't really agree with uh, that's the only thing because the state of Connecticut is having a difficult time with attracting businesses or anyone. Mr. Robert, so um, New Milford has a pretty high property tax rate compared to other communities. Um, it you, depends on where you compare it to my parents if you're, they live in Westchester. Okay. So they <laughs> <laughs> disagree with you. They're <laughs> very impressed when I tell them my taxes here. <laughs> uh, so do you think it's too low then? Do you think it's too high? About uh, no. And, and let me, uh, so the second part of that question is, uh, if it is too high, how do you, how do you cut? Yeah. <laughs> the, when you're dealing with people's taxes, and this is something that's been drilled into me as an attorney, you're talking about other people's money. You, you've got a fiduciary responsibility when you're dealing with other people's money to use it in the best way possible. And I hate going back and asking people for money. And what we have is taxes continuing to go up every year, every year, and we don't understand you know, what we're even getting for these increases. So what, what do I think? I think taxes should be lower, but I achieve that by going through the fat in the budget and eliminating positions and going through and seeing why are we are spending our money and redirecting that into the areas where it's going to actually improve um, the quality of life of the town. Specifically, in getting more teachers to reduce class sizes, which is something that every young family looks at and it's a statistic that's available on the internet for everybody. So we cut taxes in certain places, we redirect it, we attract more businesses and more jobs. We emphasize you know, the manufacturing and industrial sector, which has lain stagnant in New Milford. And we start to reverse this trend where we're kind of um, shrinking and going downward to attracting people and being a leader in the Northwest Hills. That's what I think we need to do. And as far as taxes, we could do it. There's a lot of fat, there's a lot of fat built up over 12 years, and I'm gonna come in there, I'm gonna cut it. This could have easily gotten you first as a question, so what, uh, you have a response? I do have a response, and while I would love to say that we could always reduce taxes, we do try to do that, but everyone still wants things. 
And so I would say the school budget right now is almost 70% of our operating budget. And it is more than half of our debt service. So I would say that we really invest in our, in our schools. <coughs> Excuse me. Part of the reason that some of these taxes go up, which I know everyone believes in, is um, supporting our staff. So in the school, you had a three and a half, well, a little under three and a half percent increase with regard to some of the teachers and administrators increases. That right there will uh, make your budget go up without any fat. And um, so all the way around, things still do cost. I, do, I rarely enjoy a, a snowstorm anymore because it uh, costs a lot to uh, keep the streets safe for people, send out your emergency vehicles, and uh, maintain the type of safety in our road system that the, that the people expect all winter long. So there are a lot of things that um, we do. We have saved money with a lot of safety programs and gotten rebates back with insurance, uh, training programs to, for uh, safety, and gotten more discounts, locking in our uh, uh, utilities. Um, we do everything possible, include uh, bulk purchasing, consortium buying, all of that. You have 30 seconds if you want to respond to just to address the schools, New Milford has dropped to one of the lowest per student spending in the area. We used to be on par with, with all the surrounding towns. We're down on par with Danbury. People see that. So whatever you talk about, you know, how great the schools are, people look at statistics when they're coming here. They look at 23 and 24 kids per student per, uh, per class, and they look at how much money you're spending uh, per student. So on that topic, uh, so you said that the school budget is 70% of the budget. You just said that taxes are too high. He's saying spend more on schools. Uh, he's talking about a subpar reputation. Um, is the, is, do you agree with the word subpar reputation, first I, of all? I don't agree with, I don't agree with uh, subpar reputation, uh, especially in the lower grades where the scores have increased. And they have been busy changing the curriculum to find a good fit for our community with regard to the programs that they offer. So I don't believe that our uh, school district is subpar. And um, uh, you need, do we need a higher uh, school budget to address class size and some of these issues? Well, I think that the school budget that's going to be asked for next year will be larger. I've never seen them not ask for more. Um, and you have to also take into account the people who live in our community and what can they afford to pay. And that is one of the things that you know, if you came out to the budget process, which uh, Mr. Grumbach came to the first night where we were talking about the budget, but I didn't see him at another one, to, um, to uh, su make suggestions or assist in any way during that whole time, um, he was absent. So I would say that um, I think right now the schools, the principals put their budget forward, they take it to the superintendent, she brings it to the Board of Ed, the Board of Ed sends it to me, I review it, send it to the council, it goes to the Board of Finance, it goes to the town meeting, it goes to referendum, and the people select the budget. The people support or not the budget. Yeah, um, I, uh, I did go to the budget meeting. It was tedious and boring. It almost did not want to make me run for mayor anymore. But I understand what an important process it is. And I've heard this criticism before from people, and the issue is, you know, we showed up at the Pettibone hearings, and we, we spoke out, we came with statistics and charts, and we were ignored. And so I got to the point where I'm not here to bang my head against the wall anymore and hope that somebody listens to me that's in power. You know, we're here as a slate, it's not just me, I can't do this alone, but we've got a great democratic slate that's running for office because we're not here to try to influence the mayor or influence her administration. We're here to take over. We're here to say we could do a better job and we've got a better vision and give us the chance to do so. Do so. It's been 12 years. You've seen the result of 12 years of this administration. Give us a chance and you're gonna see what we could do with it. You have 30 seconds, do you want to have anything more to say or? No. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Robert, so you, you just said uh, earlier in talking about tax being too high and cutting the budget that you would cut uh, unnecessary positions. Can you name some positions that you would cut? That would be a horrible thing for me to do right now to put somebody's head on the chopping block. But I know that there are, we are just in uh, the Board of Ed, you know, there's, a, there's an impression that we are 
uh, in the educational system, we're top heavy. We're paying a lot of big salaries and we have a lot of positions that, were they not there, would go to fund teachers who are actually in the classroom educating our students and getting those class sizes down. So you gotta have a good balance between the people that are actually doing the work and the administrators that are kind of overseeing what's going on. And the perception right now is that we're top heavy on that. So by cutting $100,000 positions could add two teachers. Uh, so there's right, there's right there. And also, we hear a lot about how there's a population decline and how there's less business. Well, population has gone, da gone down, business has gone down in New Milford, but the size of our government seems to only continue to increase. And I know that that's part of the inertia of government. But when I'm coming in here, I don't owe anybody any loyalties, I don't owe anybody any baggage. All right? When I come in there, if you cannot justify that your job is adding to the, um, to the quality of New Milford, to the maintenance of New Milford, then that's a job that's going to be up for consideration for elimination. And that's what I owe to the taxpayers of this town, to look at every single position, every single benefit, and say, is this adding or is it taking away from our ability to run this town? Sure. Um, I like to think that the people that we have working for the town right now, and I can't speak to every individual job at the Board of Ed because that's not my purview, uh, is providing a good service to the public. One of the things in government that people forget about at the local level is it's hands-on. When a person from the public comes into the town hall or any of our other buildings, they're not talking to a machine and they're looking for uh, someone to solve whatever their particular concern is at the time. And you have to have a person for that. On that side of the uh, board of ed that I did want to mention is that the classroom size is dictated by contract. So that's another thing that is, if the contract negotiations end up that way, that's what dictates the size of the classroom. Um, we have gone through our budget over and over. We've reduced people, we've brought people in, we have part-time people. Generally speaking, if you look at the library, we have like 16 part-timers to save money <coughs> rather than um, everybody being full-time. Because when you say somebody's salary, you have to remember as well that probably a third of that you have to tack on because that's the overhead for maintaining an employee. So um, we don't have too many of the teachers that would fit into the 100,000 only cost category when you include training and overhead. But um, we review everybody's job, how valuable they are, and the other thing is, life happens. So you have employees, if you have an office that only has one person in it, it's hard to get fewer people than that. Some offices we have in town hall have two people. Some have one and a half. Um, they rotate schedules, they switch times to come in, they'll make appointments to be there for people with certain um, things that they need. So our minimum, or you, people used to call it zero-based bu budgeting or uh, uh, government-based budgeting is, there is a certain amount of staffing you have to provide because there are services by law that you must provide. You don't get to choose them like a business. So that is really where we start, is what we have to do and then we add on to that. And I'd say that right now we're not running with a whole lot of extra. You have 30 seconds if you have anything else to add. You call my office, I don't have a secretary, I pick up the phone. So I, I know what it's like to handle, uh, you know, to wear a bunch of different hats and I do all the work myself in my office with my wife that I have as well. So, you know, I know what it's like to feel the pressure of having a budget and um, you know, watching the money going in and coming out. Uh, but that's what I'm bringing to government, that business sense of trying to keep our costs low and our income high is the same kind of, is the same kind of um, culture that I'm gonna bring as mayor. So, uh, Mayor, in recent years we've seen um, more and more kind of big box retail happening and chains coming in. Um, and um, and uh, we saw the beautiful downtown in, in New Milford and <coughs> some of the local businesses that are struggling to some extent. How do you balance that need for economic development on kind of, uh, of that, uh, that big chain kind of atmosphere versus maintaining the rural character of, of downtown? Well, it goes back to the 1960s on the struggle for the downtown including kids hanging out on the corner, um, if you go back in their records. But it's in accordance with our plan of conservation and development. In our POCD that we did a few years ago, the public came out and participated in a variety of workshops and had the opportunity for input in deciding where we wanted to um, 
utilize space for all the different uh, interests of anyone in the community. So Route 7 had already been developed. And so everybody voted, it was a unanimous vote uh, at the council, that they would support the POCD because so many different groups came in and got to discuss what they wanted and preserve what they wanted, whether it was agriculture, um, the downtown business village center group, <coughs> historic groups were recognized, and also the commercial corridor of Route 7. So um, I think it was a good plan. We had a lot of different work groups, a lot of different views. It also spoke about future development, the riverfront. We put bike trails in there. Um, we really had an, an awesome community exchange. So I think that in keeping with the POCD, and of course I'd like to see everybody um, plant more beautiful plant things out there on Route 7, but that's really not my purview on private property. But following the POCD, I think most of our boards and commissions have uh, been good stewards. Yes. If the POCD has been followed and, it lead, and it's led to what we have right now for Route 7, then all of those people should, be, should never have run for re-election again. Route 7 is a mess. And it's because there hasn't been any kind of plan of development for it. If there was something, that, if there was a vision, if there was a plan, then the mayor would not have called for uh, the hiring of a consultant to develop a strategic plan 12 years after she was elected. 12 years later, we're calling for a strategic plan when we've had this kind of haphazard, um, ad hoc development along Route 7. Uh, that is not, <laughs> if New Milford plans New Route 7 to be the way it is today, then we're all in a lot of trouble. And, I'm up here because of that, because I see where Route 7 and where the entire town is going and it's turning into where I come from, Central Avenue and Yonkers, Route 1 along uh, the shore, um, some of the Route 6 in, in Westchester. These are places that are just dominated by big box stores, gas stations, and Dunkin' Donuts. And they've completely sold the character to their town. Uh, I want to stop New Milford from going down that route. We're, we're well along the way. But there's hope to turn it around. There's hope to bring in um, office spaces and jobs, to bring in medical offices, to bring in more mid-sized retail companies that offer um, something more than Dollar Store and Dunkin' Donuts. We've got that opportunity here. We've got the potential to be like that. But right now, there doesn't seem any kind of drive or vision to make that happen. And that's why I'm here. And I look at Route 7 as one of the driving forces for why I'm running. Uh, and what my vision for the future could be. Sure, the plan of conservation and development is different than the strategic plan. And so I'm not gonna explain all of that here, but it is, they're two very different documents. And Route 7 has also uh, been plagued by pre-existing businesses, which you cannot do anything with under the regulatory structure because they were pre-existing before zoning came into existence. Would I love a lot of phenomenal office buildings here? Yes. But until you fill all the ones on the 84 corridor that are empty in Danbury and Brookfield, really most businesses won't come up here. They calculate a time and a cost to travel, and um, we try to do our best to get businesses up here, and we try to encourage economic development, but the private property owner still has private property and can sell their property to whatever business they deem. I mean, we're still a democracy. Mr. Robert, so you've talked to us, keeping on this Route 7 theme, uh, you've talked about traffic congestion, particularly um, at Silver River Drive and Veterans Bridge. Mm -hmm. But if you got elected, and you're mayor, and you're in charge, how, how do you make, wave a magic wand and fix that? How specifically, specifically? I'm not waving a magic wand, and that's not my promise to anybody. But we've had 12 years of this problem getting steadily and steadily worse. And what you need to do, if you're going to address the major infrastructure problems for the traffic along Route 7 and the traffic along um, Still River. You've got to have a plan to do that now. And the state has um, announced initiatives to fund transportation initiatives throughout the state. Uh, and we need a new bridge at, um, at, across the river. Um, it doesn't make any sense to have Super 7, this beautiful highway that transports people up here to grind to a grinding halt uh, at the bridge. So. Can I wave a magic wand and do anything about it right now? No, but I could lay the groundwork so that New Milford is in line to get some major um, 
infrastructure payments from the state, from the federal government, to build another bridge, to address the traffic along Still River in the downtown as part of a cohesive plan and not just one project at a time, one project here, one project there. It's never gonna, it's never gonna resolve it because the fact is we want people to move here, but we're dissuading them from doing so because of the traffic and most of the people commute. And they shouldn't have to get to town and sit in traffic to cross the bridge for 10, 15, 20 minutes. It's not right, but we need to lay the groundwork now. Sure. Well, I would have to agree that I didn't like the way the state finished off Route 7 with the two-lane bridge, but the town of New Milford several years ago had turned down the bridge widening project that the state had had on the books at that time. And when you speak to them about it again today, they will still remind you that the town of New Milford did that. They also had had an east-west connector in the plan, and the exchange at 67 Grove Street, the improved uh, traffic pattern that we have there, was still on the books when I was elected. So I did pick a design, we did do that, and the state does not offer up multi-million dollar monies for a project unless it fits into some of the plans they have. And right now their corridor is the I-95-91 up to the airport corridor where they're really socking a lot of infrastructure. We ask, a lot of those grants have limits on the dollar amount, and so then you have to guarantee a certain <coughs> dollar amount from your community, and your community has to be willing to uh, pay for those. We have had traffic studies, we do have traffic improvement plans. The only thing is you have to spend the people's money. And so we're very careful when we're reviewing um, all the wants and needs of all the different areas of the community uh, with regard to spending. And it would be great to have a, a new bridge for 30, 40, or 50 million dollars. Or the other one for the east-west connector that would go through the Century Brass property out to 202. But um, they will listen and they'll accept your request. Yeah. I'm an advocate. What I do is advocate on behalf of difficult questions and difficult issues. That's what I do for a living. So the fact that it's hard to get a bridge or to get funding for it, to me, isn't an excuse. Yes, it's hard. If it was easy, everybody would do it, and there'd be bridges everywhere. But the fact <laughs> is, we need it. And part of what I bring to this job and to this candidacy is the ability to advocate for these difficult positions to get some real results. So we have, we're going to talk a lot more about some really specific things, but I want to get big picture for a second. Mayor, and, and say, ask you to look out 10 years from now. You have a great perspective in terms of the, the 12 years you've been in office. 10 years from now, New Milford, culturally, demographically, economically, what are the, the biggest uh, potential opportunities and the biggest potential challenges as a way in, in, in the, the trend that you see population growth, economics? Well, I, th I think that we have a potential to attract a lot more uh, youthful families with regard to, I see an athletic facility with ball fields and a community center. Um, I see assisted living facilities. I, um, I would love that. Uh, more senior housing. I'd like to see uh, smaller neighborhood housing, like the kind of community I grew up in, like, uh, like the Wonder Years. I, I was like those size houses. But um, I also would like to see, uh, I came from sidewalks and street lights, and so there are appropriate places for that because I think it helps uh, lend itself to the neighborhood feel and it's, it's safer community. I see the lower part of Route 7 allowing for offices and uh, business space. And I'm hoping that someday maybe Kimberly Clark will reinvest in more. Uh, perhaps we can attract somebody for more of the industrial uh, property that we have on Boardman Road. Century Brass, I have a uh, reusable or renewable energy source in the plan out there and uh, businesses that utilize three to six acres each or small industrial complex on the uh, freight line. And I see a uh, technological upgrade. You said 10 years, right? So we're not we're not flying on the road yet, we're still driving. And um, some more bike trails. Um, I'd like to extend our uh, pedestrian friendly walkways. And um, 
I think a, I see a great quality of life. Hopefully, the state of Connecticut can uh, keep up. Thank you. Ye yesterday was the anniversary of the Back to the Future, uh, October 21st, 2015, and there were supposed to be flying cars and uh, um, you know clothes that shrunk wrap to you. Um, it's fun to to kind of look into the future and try to see what it's going to hold. Um, right now, I see we're at, we're at a crossroads. Um, and the reason why I'm running is because I do have a vision for the next 10 years. It's a vision of New Milford that include, involves a, a vibrant downtown area um, with small you know, local retail spaces that doesn't rely on an angel investor to prop it up uh, whenever, we, whenever we have an empty building. Uh, it's an area of New Milford, the riverfront should have uh, bike trails that connect from Kent all the way down to Brookfield. And I see people um, using the riverfront for kayaking, for canoeing, and attracting people into New Milford from the surrounding towns, not just New Milford, but getting Kent and Roxbury and Washington and New Preston, getting these people into New Milford, using the facilities that we have here, spending their money at the restaurants and stores and shops. Um, and that's what I see. I see Route 7 salvaged from the kind of wasteland of parking lots and big box stores that we have now. I see um, interesting development from interesting stores, you know, grabbing some shoe stores, some, some mid to, lo to, to lower level retail um, from Danbury, even the mall, to have an outdoor mall up there. Litchfield Crossings had such a potential to be a, an outlaw, outlet mall to have up in Lee, Massachusetts, and it's turned into just a giant parking lot. So um, I think it's disappointing what we have now, but I'm trying to promote a vision for the future that has hope and the opportunity to <coughs> right these wrongs because businesses will come here. We have a lot to offer. Even though we're not, we're not close to 84, that's our greatest asset. 84 is a congested mess. So what New Milford has to offer, uh, it needs to be able to promote itself in such a way that it can make this vision a reality. Do you have 30 seconds? Do you want to add anything else to this discussion? No, I would agree with a lot of Mr. Grombach's vision, which was similar to some of mine. The question is, how much money are, will, are people willing to pay for it? And while I love the idea of everything um, being wonderful, and I am an optimist by nature, I'm kind of saddled with knowing what the cost of uh, doing business is here in New York. So while I am a hard advocate when I get up into Hartford and speak to people with regard to what my community needs are. Um, I'm plagued by reality, so. Also passenger rail, we're gonna throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so New Milford is, has been facing like a lot of uh, uh, rural communities in um, Connecticut, communities of all sizes, um, kind of an epidemic of opioid and heroin resulting in crime and so forth. Um, and it's, the, the thought that has occurred to me when I see these articles about it is if this was an E. coli outbreak or some other new disease that was claiming so many lives and had such a huge impact that there would be like an emergency uh, declaration and we would fix it. So what, are, what, what more could, could be done? Unfortunately, I see the heroin problem from a real um, personal perspective. I represent a lot of people and families in town who are dealing with this and I see the tragedy of parents that don't know what to do with you know a son or a daughter who's addicted you know people that relapse uh, getting the help that they need wanting to get clean and not being able to and I see the effect that it has on the entire community I mean from children the, the children that they have to their parents to the criminal justice system all the way through it's um, it's a mess so what would I say to do? I have a three-pronged approach to it. Number one, there's got to be more enforcement, and just not for the low-hanging fruit. The people that are, the guys that are selling drugs to maintain their habit, um, yes, the numbers look good when you arrest these guys and send them to jail, but you're making zero dent in the actual problem. You've got to emphasize and have sting operations to hit the, um, the drug suppliers and the people higher up in the chain. You do that by using more enforcements, by spending money to make every single potential buyer a potential informant by offering a $5,000 reward for anybody that leads to an arrest and conviction. And you do that, you make the cost of doing business in New Milford go up. Secondly, you've got to address um, 
prevention. When we've got kids as captive audiences in school, we've got to use that time to the, to the best of our advantage by inoculating them against any kind of experimenting with drugs. And it goes with alcohol, pot, heroin. It's not just heroin. I'll tell a story. When I was growing up, um, I was in elementary school and my mom smoked. And you know they, were, they did such a great job of educating us in school that I came home and I used to throw my mom's cigarettes out. And she stopped after that. She hated me, but she stopped. But it's, it just goes to show how important it is to create a culture when they're young, when they're in elementary school. The fact that the D.A.R.E. program has been cut for funding reasons and that we do not, um, that the, the approach is haphazard, um, it's a shame. Sure. Well, we are already taking steps here in New Milford and we do have a uh, pretty strict police force and they do do sting operations and they do operate with the FBI and the state police with regard to taking down big drug dealers. And part of that is, it's not like TV, you can't get a warrant in 20 minutes and solve the crime in an hour and it takes a lot of evidence. And so we do have that. Of course, the bad side of that is when you arrest a local dealer who someone was getting drugs from, they now, that person who wants drugs goes and looks for it someplace else. And so usually it ends up being a different level, cut with different <coughs> things, and, and that actually contributes to um, the overdose and the death rate. I, I would like you to know that I have um, asked through CCM that they consider for the next legislative session that school nurses be allowed to administer Narcan in case it ever happens that we need that in any of our schools. In July, I called Governor Malloy and asked him to consider declaring a health emergency with regard to drug abuse um, in the state of Connecticut so that we could bring uh, more attention to really how rampant it is within all of our communities. And he told me he would think about it. This August, I wrote a letter to the governor both senators and congresswomen to get the FCC to end advertising of prescription drugs to the general public everywhere. Every time you look at something, we're telling somebody not to take drugs, but every commercial is loaded with pills. I wouldn't even want to know what I had to have to take them. And I think that means we're speaking as a society out of both sides of our mouth. I sent those letters the week of my birthday, which was August 18th, in case anyone wants to send a card. And um, I have not even gotten a kind of response. Um, over the next couple of months, our local police will all be trained uh, with the nasal Narcan administration. And I also have been speaking to an outreach group and another group of people and um, others with regard to developing a curriculum not so much directed at the young children, but to the young parents of young children that have not yet been presented with these terrible uh, opportunities. Um, so that we could educate the parents on what to look out for, what the current trends are, uh, what might be some of the signs that there's something going on in the neighborhood that they should pay attention to. And I also, excuse me, also have always supported our Substance Abuse Council, our HB CASA, and um, any of the outreach programs. So, um, already there. Right. Uh, 30 seconds. Very briefly, if, if, if we need Narcan, <coughs> For school nurses, if kids are overdosing on heroin in school, then like, um, like the moderator said, this has got to be, this is a red flag, all hands alert kind of situation. If it's that bad that kids are overdosing in school, we need to take action now. We need, the time for talk is over, people need treatment, they need to know that there's a place where they can go to get clean and not just go to jail. Okay, so Mayor, um, the um, Lowe's and Fish's Soup Kitchen is, as you know, is planning to, to, to uh, turn it to build a new uh, facility on Bridge Street. But some people have criticized um, the decisions that kind of make them leave the Richmond building in the first place. I'm wondering if you could address that. Well, I didn't make the decision to make them leave, and they've never received notice. There's never been a note sent. They weren't told they had to leave. A couple of years ago, John Rogers, who was married at one of the originators, approached me in my office and asked me if I would help them find a home because they wanted to develop new programs. So I said, well, I didn't have anything available that I knew of right now. How much space you're looking for? How much money do you want to spend? What are you interested in? And I went about my day and 
over the next several months, looked around and finally thought, you know, there's an awful lot of property in front of Faith Church. I'll ask the church if they would be willing to host loaves and fishes because they wanted to have programs. I brought a councilwoman with me to attend a meeting with the pastor. There were three people from Loaves and Fishes, which was now a new board. And there was an engineer and a board member from the church. They volunteered to help them with um, the permitting, support them with commercial kitchen, um, assist with counseling and maybe job entry programs. And I said we would provide bus passes if somebody was in town and needed to travel there. So all those people were in the room. And um, Loaves and Fishes didn't think that would be a good fit for them. The other place that I had suggested was off of Still River. They didn't think that was a good suggestion, and after that I didn't make any more suggestions. However, people misconstrued that as something else. I can't be responsible for what other people think, and I don't take shots at people in the press or attack them for their views. I'm not gonna start. And I think that, you know, Loaves and Fishes what they provide the community is very worthy. You don't want anyone to be hungry. And uh, they were here for 10 years. So it's not like I woke up one day and said, oh, you have to leave. Someone came and asked me for help. I offered it. They didn't want it. That's <coughs> it. Sure. sure. You know, you could ask Lowe's, why are they leaving? I mean, you know, it's not for me to say. It's been out there in the papers. They've said that they were asked to leave. Um, I don't think they wanted to leave. They, from what I understand they invested something like you know fifty thousand dollars in rehabbing that space so that they could occupy it. So um, you know the, the fact that they've decided to leave is certainly a big decision for them. And they do offer something to the community that spans party lines. It's not Republican. It's not Democrat. You're talking about feeding people who can't feed themselves, not just homeless, but people who just can't make ends meet. Um, so their mission is, is an important one, and, and to some extent, it actually relieves the burden off of governments who uh, you know, might be required to step in if Lowe's wasn't there. So um, Lowe's went through that incredibly you know, zoning process, which to a lot of people did seem very political. Um, they made an application where the zoning board would usually work with them and say, okay, here's what you gotta do, X, Y, and Z. Um, the zoning board denied it, and you know, I've said from the beginning, part of, of you know, the culture right now is that certain things are politicized that should not be. And zoning is something that should never be politicized. It's, a, you know, it's regulations, you meet it, you get approved, or you don't, and here's what you gotta do. So um, the loaves and fishes issue, I think, backfired in a lot of ways in the fact that you know they were supposed to be out of town and they were supposed to be out of downtown, and the people of the community rightfully stood up and said, um, this is wrong, and it's not about Democrat or Republican. It's about you know what New Milford stands for, and whether or not we're going to let people who can't feed themselves um, not be able to. And um, part of Loaves and Fish's mission is to do that in downtown where they could um, address their clients. So I, I think it worked out in the end, but it's been a long and torturous process to get here, um, and I think it's worth noting. Do you have thirty seconds? Sure. A um, couple of things Lowe's and Fishes at the time told me they would like to do is be able to have a laundry facility, um, a little conference room, a place where they could provide counseling and things like that, which the Richmond Center building uh, isn't large enough to facilitate. And Ralph, I'm glad that you said that zoning should be based on regulations because it is. And I know the Zoning Commission approves you if you meet the regulation and if not, they don't just say no, you get suggestions on what you can do, whether it's going to ZBA or what you can adjust in your plan. They're a very fair group, so thank you. Mr. Grubbuck, so you mentioned passenger rail service. So um, you support extension of passenger rail service to New Milford and points beyond. And if you do, um, what can the town do to make that happen? And do you support the town spending any money to try to help make that happen or support development around it? Yeah. I'll answer the easy part of that question first, and, and that was the first part. And yes, you know, I know that Massachusetts is already um, interested in reestablishing passenger rail um, from the Connecticut Massachusetts border. Uh, so I do support bringing passenger rail, not just from Danbury to New Milford, but New Milford and parts north, part points north. Now, how do we get that done? And and this comes back again to being an advocate and um, presenting an argument, building evidence. Um, and bringing pressure on the people that are making this decision 
to actually come to our side. It's not easy. I mean, inertia is a terrible thing to overcome. And we've had decades of inertia of um, non-use of this, of this line. The fact that it's still being used for freight and everything else is, is kind of a blessing, though. So you've got to have a plan. You've got to have forces mobilized. Uh, to enact this plan, and you've got to be consistent in your approach in dealing with the state government, in dealing with the federal government. You've got to marshal everybody. It's, it's not just me. We've got state representatives. We've got federal representatives. That We've all got to be on the same team and work together to get this done. Now, would I support spending money to do this? Anything worth doing and doing right is going to cost some money. So I'm not saying that you could do this on the cheap. Sometimes you get what you pay for. And if you're going to make a serious effort to restore passenger rail and the economic benefits that it's going to bring to New Milford are far going to outweigh any initial uh, cost to get it done. Well, everyone knows that I've always been in favor of passenger rail. One of the things with this line right now is it's not safe for passenger trains at this point. And by estimation of the people who own it, it's about a $223 million project. I also am in favor of it going to Pittsfield. I like the idea of it going through the River Valley from an economic development point of view. I have proposed to the railroad that they actually could have dining cars that host um, guest chefs, artwork from the people in the valley, uh, Goat Boy soap, anything that we make, uh, Kimberly Clark tissues, to promote everything, the talent, the skill set, the businesses in our valley, and I think that it would be a great item. The DOT commissioner came to our COG meeting. In front of everybody, I asked him the chances of getting the rail north to Massachusetts. And I also know that Massachusetts had done some substantial investment, bought some property, and it's about $12 million. And he said that until that rail line, it can show that it would be beneficial and do some of the maintenance that the state has asked them to do. Um, it might not be in their overall transportation page, but it still is mentioned. So we put it in all our regional plans, we put it in our local plans, and we constantly harass the uh, DOT with regard to any kind of passenger upgrade, because I agree it, it would be a benefit. 30 seconds, if you have anything else. Yeah, everything, any, especially a project like this, is gonna be difficult. It's gonna have obstacles. There's gonna be, pe there's gonna be people telling you, well, it's not in the budget right now, it's not in the plans, it's too hard, X, Y, and Z. That's not an obstacle when you're advocating on behalf of your town. I mean, our job is to overcome those obstacles. That's why you elect your leaders. Not to say that it's harder to say, oh, okay, tell us when you, are, uh, when you will approve it. Our job is to say, here's why you need to approve it now. Hey, so um, what, do you, what can the town do more to support the arts, or what do you think the, the, the uh, town's role is in Providing um, um, space for events, or um, or just using your bully pulpit to to to. to um, I don't really like the word bully. <laughs> We're trying to do away with bully yeah. in our society. But um, well, I think New Milford has been a good advocate for the arts. We have theater works, and we have a. a I mean, I couldn't believe how many artists we had in our own community until I really got involved with our commission of the arts, who. Uh, really was at the forefront in helping develop, develop the gallery that we had, one of the few town-sponsored galleries in Connecticut with regard to supporting uh, the arts. They have a variety of uh, speaking engagements, artists, shows. Um, I, I have an art walk grant that I got from the state that we're designing as an art space behind the library and a venue for events in, in a more uh, smaller urban setting rather than out on the green. I think that um, there's always room. I love seeing it in the high school. Uh, their shows are exemplary, and I, I think it's an important part of our life. Both of my daughters went to college for the arts. My, my youngest, I've got to give her a plug, is a senior at Savannah College of Art and Design. So I think it's a real important part of the life that we have here. And we recently created the Poet Laureate position uh, Last week, as a matter of fact, at the council meeting, so I'm in favor. Thank you. Yeah, we live in a really unique setting up here in New Milford. We've got tremendous creative and artistic talent, whether it's being bled off from um, the New York from metro area. I know there's some people that come up here from that, but it seems like the geography itself just lends itself to 
you know, an amazing amount of creativity. And um, people are doing this in their backyards, in their basements. They're doing it on, um, they're doing SD um, kind of businesses. So it's incredible. And you see that in New Milford too, between the Village Center of the Arts, and we've got these great dance studios. Um, but they're struggling. It's not easy. Um, they're struggling to attract people. They're struggling to, to keep their head above water. And you know, the arts don't add anything to our bottom line budget, but they add to the culture, and it adds to what make New Milford an interesting and culturally interesting place to be and to live. And right now, our dedication to them and our support of them is de minimis. And, and more needs to be done to make sure that people continue to come to New Milford, not just the artists themselves, but as patrons, um, to support the arts here, because it's, it goes from the children all the way up to the adults. And uh, I can't emphasize how important it is, but uh, that I do talk to you know, the organizations in town, and that it's not easy, that they are struggling, and that they could use more support. No, I agree. I think they're great institutions. Great. Uh, Mr. Grover, so the town's effort to uh, attract commercial development using kind of tax evasion programs has been, let's say, not a conspicuous success so far. Um, is there, are you all in with that program, and is there any way that you would improve it, or are there alternatives uh, in terms of spurring economic development that you're in for? Yeah, you know, th there's one thing that I was really impressed about. You won't hear me say this very often, but um, Rick Perry, for, you know, the former governor of Texas, came to Connecticut a while back, and he, he was in the news for a while because he was barnstorming across the country. And I was so impressed with him, not because of his policies, but he is out there advocating on behalf of his state. He's knocking on businesses' doors saying, come to Texas, come to us, here's what we have to offer, here's what you can do here, here's why it's such a great place to do business. And that's really what a chief executive, whether it's a a town, uh, you know, a state, or a country, part of their job is to be an advocate for that town, to get out, knock on some doors, get out of the office, make phone calls, and actually visit people to bring them here. So, you know, the tax abatement issue alone is never gonna be enough. Just holding out a carrot and say, please come here, you know, please come, you know, bring your, your, um, your facility to us, and we'll give you all these tax breaks, you'll, you'll, you'll make a lot of money. It's not enough to do that. There has to be an effort to not only condition tax breaks with you know, things that are actually going to benefit New Milford, but you've got to have a plan to go out there and actually solicit and bring people in. So I don't think tax breaks are alone. I think the 100% tax abatement is a mistake um, because we're underselling New Milford. New Milford has a lot of opportunity. P businesses come here, they make money. And by giving away these 100% tax abatements, um, you're basically starting from a position, from a negotiating point of view, you're saying, you know, we've got this 100% tax abatement, and that's all you're gonna ask for. So the fact that it's even available, we've already set ourselves, you know, six feet in a hole from a negotiating point of view. Uh, I think New Milford has to emphasize its qualities, its strengths, and it's gotta actually advocate to bring people here into businesses. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I do spend a lot of time at is, what Mr. Gombach just described as advocating for New Milford with regard to businesses. And, and one of the things that is uh, probably the least expensive investment dollar with regards to economic development is trying to hang on to the large businesses that you already have. So New Milford has worked cooperatively with Kimberly Clark and the state to keep them here. We've done a lot of programs with Mealtran. We've worked with the hospital to keep their doors open. And then we also have worked with colleges with regard to how their curriculum prepares our children to actually work for the businesses that are here in the state of Connecticut and in New Milford and in our region. So I agree, everyone has to get out there and speak to everybody and try to have them get here. Abatements are not the only thing that will do it. Actually, the new uh, abatement is a rewrite of the old ordinance that's been on the books for years and did allow the council to extend an abatement hundred percent if if so meeting whatever the criteria were with regard to jobs or employees or things like that so it's really not that new it just has a graph identifying different dollar investments by the business but uh, we do have some new business investments coming up that are quite exciting one big one on picket district so I, I think I do agree with them and we're out there you're happy you can come with me <laughs> you have 30 seconds
seconds if you uh, have anything else to add? Um, yeah, you know, if this is the plan that's been followed for the past 12 years, where are the new businesses? Where are the new factories? Where is, where is the new industry? We're struggling so hard just to maintain Kimberly Clark. Something is not working here. Uh, so a different approach needs to be taken. And that's what I'm offering, a different approach to reevaluate what we've been doing for the past 12 years and to figure out something that's actually going to bring business and jobs, not just Dunkin' Donuts and um, um, service jobs, low-wage jobs, but actual jobs that people can live on. So, um, Mayor. Can I comment on that? Okay. So, one of the things that we suffer by here in New Melford is that we are located <coughs> in the state of Connecticut, which tracks at number 50 with regard to uh, business development and how friendly we are to business. So, we don't stop trying to attract them, but every once in a while the overhead or the cost of doing business or the cost of having employees, whether it's workers comp or any of those other programs, does get ahead of you. So you have to take a look at the reality. Of course everybody wants businesses. I'd love to have some more factories and I'd like them to be clean factories. But you have to deal with where we are and the reality. You cannot just say, oh, I, I want this pie in the sky. And there are plans. We have regular economic development programs with the state, with the federal government, regionally, in our COG, and everything. And we don't give up. We've never given up. But we do have to take and stop and understand that our state is in the slowest recovery period ever seen since World War II. And so, Mr. Chairman, why don't you take about 30 seconds? So, someone, blame, yeah. someone blame your party in control in the state uh, on some of these conditions that are affecting you can't approach this from a, po a point of view where I'm blaming somebody else or we're suffering. I mean, if you go into any negotiation with that kind of mindset, you've already lost. They already have you, you know, behind the eight ball. They're going to negotiate rings around you if you come into something from a position of weakness. You know, if you come in there admitting, here's everything that's wrong with us, you're done. You gotta go in there <laughs> with the presentation of, here's what's great about us. Here's what we offer. And that's what you gotta do. And that's how you overcome this kind of negative stigmatism about what well, Connecticut's the worst. I don't care about the rest of Connecticut. I live in New Milford, and New Milford is amazing. Okay. So there, the question, uh, the question uh, this is something, I was a publisher, a newspaper publisher in Torrington, and we um, kind of continually saw this trend of decisions about tourism, <coughs> about business, even nonprofits like Girl Scouts and Red Cross, being made not locally, being like merged into to statewide or regional things. Um, so uh, whether it's Danbury Hospital being in control of your local hospital or uh, tourism being decided in Danbury or Waterbury, how does New Milford still have a kind of voice in amidst some of those changes? And how big of an impact has it had? Well, New Milford is actually in two of the different arts cultures areas. We are in an overlap area with Danbury and Tornington with regard to that and with tourism. So we've always uh, advocated how beautiful it is here, uh, how much culture is here, the history, uh, one of our best resources, the people. And um, I think when the state regionalized, they also spread out the dollars very thinly with regard to that. So we did take to buying our own advertisements in books that are being published in the surrounding states and within Connecticut with regard to tourism and things like that, we did pay for that. So um, I think that we have not lost our voice, uh, although Western Connecticut is a little quieter sometimes than the central part where Hartford is. But um, I think that based on the traffic that Mr. Grombach had mentioned earlier, plenty of people come here to, to participate in what we have going. And the Housatonic River Valley, you just can't find anything more beautiful than that. So I think it speaks for itself. As a matter of fact, the council did just vote to support the designation of wild and scenic and recreational on the river uh, a couple meetings ago. So I think that we do a good job. Yeah. With, if, if we're focusing on, on tourism, New Milford and the town and the town's people, they really hold their destiny in their own hands because we've got something that you cannot manufacture, that you can't find in a lot of other towns. We've got two areas of waterfront, okay? We've got the Housatonic River, which right now is completely underutilized. I paddleboard on it. I, I put 
put in over by the, the Veterans Bridge. And I've got it completely to myself. It's beautiful, but I'd like to see people out there. And we've got Candlewood Lake, which is dominated by you know, private uh, houses along the lake. But there's so much opportunity to make that a real destination for um, surrounding towns and surrounding areas. So I'm not looking to any kind of regional authority. <coughs> we've got the means right here in New Milford to attract people to it. And you do that by developing the bike lanes and, and the walking paths along the river. You get uh, you partner with a kayak or a paddle board um, you know, service to offer rentals along the river. You've got food trucks, you bring them in so that you've got a seat and outdoor table so that during the spring, summer, and fall, people can eat outside. I mean, these are the things that you need to do to attract people to New Milford and take its destiny into our own hands. Right now, it's completely underutilized. People will flock to waterfront. I know that. I mean, I love eating outside and going on the water. Um, the fact that you can't do it here in New Milford is um, is a shame, but it's something that I would work to address and really uh, um, bring people uh, into New Milford. Yeah, 30 seconds, is there anything else you want to add? Or no, I would just say that we did get the grant that did put in facilitate the bike trail through Sega Meadows and up River Road and out, and it is also in our plan to go through town and um, also connect with Brookfield. But I too want to develop and connect the riverfront uh, with the park and make it easier to access for the public because I think it's a shame. They did that in upstate New York with the Hudson River, and I, I've always disagreed with that. I really think it should be enjoyed. So uh, we have about 15 minutes left, and we wanna, I want to shift a little bit um, and account for um, questions or topics that I may not have asked that you want your opponent to answer. Um, so I'm going to give the mayor an opportunity to ask uh, Mr. Gronbach a question about a topic, either we circle back or a topic that you think hasn't come up tonight that you'd like to discuss. Let's see. There's so many to choose from. <laughs> touched on it, but we didn't really get into it in depth. And, and it really boils down to my campaign has been about a vision for the future. And, and I've mentioned before that the town is going to contract with a consultant to prepare a strategic plan. And I guess the question is, why are we waiting 12 years to prepare a strategic plan when it wasn't done on the day one or day 20 or, or day one year. Um, why now as opposed to later? Thank you, fair question. So we have so many ongoing projects and let me go back then to 12 years ago. When I first was elected, we had so many projects sitting on the shelf and a variety of um, fiefdoms and people that weren't getting along that I first had to spend my time trying to make sure we could get everybody to speak and that um, we were more available to the public and really implement a lot of the plans that people had been arguing about over the years. So that's really what we did. We did charter revision, we did plan of conservation, we did traffic studies, and we also did a lot of the planning that a strategic plan takes into account um, by doing a plan for each group. So whether it was the Board of Ed's plan or the Economic Development Plan or the plans for any of the different uh, programs. And now what we have are a lot of variety of plans, and we also have a lot of ongoing projects, and we have a lot of requests from the public for uh, different programs and facilities. <coughs> and so a strategic plan is what helps you take where you are now, assess what you got done, and where you need to go and help prioritize with the community, work with the community so that they can identify the priorities because there are <coughs> a huge amount of ongoing projects and things to be done. So the strategic plan would help identify the direction. Yeah, two minutes ago in response to the her response to your question. Yeah, I understand that there's a lot going on. There's always a lot going on in government, but you know, the idea is after 12 years, we're finally realizing that we need a plan to figure out what we want to do. But we see the results of uh, the past 12 years and the absence of a plan. And if you're happy with the way that you know Route 7 has developed and, and you know, traffic on the weekends and how we're turning into Brookfield along where Costco is, then, then fine, then I'm the wrong person for you. But 
I have a different vision for what Route 7 could be, what New Milford could be, and I know what we do. I don't need a strategic plan to tell me what I want to do. I want to bring the community on board with me and just get it done. Uh, but it's, a, it's about doing it now and not putting it on for years and years. Yes, Route 7 does not look how I would have planned. So I really take exception with you uh, saying that. And as far as uh, a plan, I have a plan, but I'm interested in what the public's vision is of what they want. I do want to hear what they have to say about the plans that we've had, the ideas we have, the projects going forward, and help prioritize them because, after all, it is their money that's going to bring any of these plans to fruition. So I do take exception with your comments there. And I do want to extend my open door policy that I've always had for the public. And there are a ton of things going on in town, so. Hey, do you have a question for, for Mr. Grombach? Yes, I um, wanted to know what Mr. Grombach thinks should occur with Petty Bone School. That's a question I've answered a lot. That was an easy, thank you. I was <laughs> nervous it was gonna be harder. No, I never um, asked my questions. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, number one, Pettybone, as part of my platform, will remain a part of the town. Um, and what that means is it's a town asset. Uh, there are a number of different uses for it. I've always said from the beginning, and these aren't my ideas, I, I borrowed them from other people too, but I always saw, you know, we sold East Street, we moved the administrative uh, offices that are in East Street now, an old, dilapidated building that takes, that requires a lot of maintenance and upkeep selling that building to a developer for condominiums or office space, it's got great parking, it's in walking distance of the downtown, and moving those uh, offices into um, Pennybone. But in addition, you know, there are great opportunities for um, so many uh, programs within the town. The culinary school is looking for more space to use the kitchens. Uh, the robotics program is looking for space to, um, to, to have an after school program there. Um, there's adult education needs that need to be met. There's uses for, um, you know, the senior citizen population could, could have space there. There are so many opportunities to use Pettybone to benefit the town and really make it a place that's going to attract people into New Milford. I would love to see a technical school or a STEM program set up over there. They're talking about building an entirely new school in Region 12 right now for Ag STEM. We've got a, a perfect, we've got a school right now that's sitting completely empty. Can you imagine the amount of students that we could attract to New Milford if we had an emphasis on science, technology, agriculture, the things that New Milford was built upon, and yet we're gonna see that to uh, um, you know, Region 12, we'll be sending our kids there. So there is so much, there's so much potential to use the Pettibone School as a town resource. Um, and right now, that is a process that will be opened up to the community. Um, but it's, it's something that has to be done because by just selling that property, um, we lose the battle of perception, which is we're only interested in uh, big box stores, we're only interested in development, we're not interested in actually investing in the community. Uh, and that's what Perry Bone represents for me. I think he wants to volunteer to be on the committee. <laughs> so um, there has been no decision made about selling Pettybone. So I know a postcard went out saying that, and that's a total lie. Um, there have been no discussions with any developers. I too look at it as a resource and an asset to the community. So I think all the ideas that have come forward have been great. Um, they all provide some kind of a benefit. The committees will be charged to find out what the benefits are and what the costs associated would be. So I think that it's a, a great opportunity for the community. Uh, no one has ever said the building was to be sold, and that decision would be made by the people in the town of New Milford because we don't buy or sell property without the public's input and a vote. So I, um, I'm pleased that you like all those ideas because I've heard many myself, and some of them are downright fabulous and exciting, and I look forward to uh, working with that. Respond just briefly. I just wanted to ask, you know, we're elected to be leaders of this town. Yes, it's important to get input from the community, but I would like the mayor to go on record as saying, do you have an opinion as to how that property should be used, should be kept for town purposes, or should it be sold for potential development? My personal opinion is that I really think I would like to have an assisted living facility. 
but it's not my personal opinion that I operate on. I operate on what the community wants and what the long-term benefit is to the people that are here. Now, for me, okay, I would like that. If somebody showed me something better, I like a living, a, a long-term facility, because assisted living facility, because it provides jobs, it adds to the tax base, it takes care of our seniors, and we don't have one close by. So my personal opinion, but my personal opinion isn't what matters when I'm discussing what does the public want and what are the long-term needs and the best uses for the, the public at large. So that may be one of the suggestions that's uh, discussed, but then we're gonna open it up for everybody to discuss. So I think that's great. Okay, so we come to closing statements and we'll probably wrap up uh, like five minutes early. So Mr. Grumbuck, why don't you uh, uh, wrap up? You have two minutes. Sure, thank you. Um, we have a lot of issues facing our town, and some of them are, are the result of this administration's policies over the past years, haphazard development, declining investments in education, infrastructure, and traffic problems, and other issues are the result of a constantly changing world. But either way, if we do nothing, if we have no vision of what this town could be and how to get there, then our town will continue to change, but not for the better. So I live here. My three children go to school here. They go to Sarah Noble. I've got two businesses here, a law firm and a bookstore on Bank Street. Um, there's no ivory tower for me. I am intimately involved in the life of our town. I'm running because I believe that with hard work, we can put New Milford on the path to prosperity and success. And that's not the path that we're on right now. We're on a path where people are wondering, why should I stay here? Or even worse, why should I move there? I can't do it alone. I've put my policies out there. I've put my positions out there. I've discussed with people why I stand for what I do. And I don't think that any of our positions as a leader of this town are personal. These positions are public. And if you have a position that you think you want to see the town enact, then it's our job as leaders of this town to explain why that vision is the right one. And that's what I've done. I'm an open book. You see, you get what you see. And I hope that you all join me on November 3rd um, to help me. Thank you. Thanks. I just have a short comment. My record exemplifies a self-driven advocacy on behalf of the town of New Milford. I care about your interests and your voice. I care about making sure resources are appropriately distributed to support what we need, but maybe not always what we want. I thank you for the experience of having been your mayor, and I humbly ask for your vote on November 3rd. Thank you.